The message that I am going to try and share with you is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Welcome back to the teaching series, The Jesus That John Knew. Uh, thank you for being with me again, and uh, if you've been with me for the whole series, uh, I do thank you even more. We're, what, 107 episodes into this now. Um, I want to return to John and to look really now towards the back end of this gospel and start to do more than clear up, I mean, start to look at some of the massive issues that are going to pertain to this story as we get into the resurrection side of this discussion. So let's have a look at John chapter 19 then and verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, and about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body and they bound it in linen cloths, with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had let, yet been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, uh, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Well now, we, we want to pick up the cast as we come the other side of the cross, because now we're, we're back into a very interesting part of this story. I want to talk to you about the, the kind of rise of a secret lover, if you like. You'll see Joseph of Arimathea, who we're introduced to here, as being someone um, who was a secret worshipper, and he was a secret worshipper because of the fear of God, uh, because of fear of the fear of the Jews. And what we're going to see, though, is we're going to see how he moves from fear to faith, how he will leap forward now, how his moment has come to step up, and step up he will. We'll see that in a second. Um, Mark gives us another dis dis description. Mark gives us a more detailed description of Joseph. He says about Joseph, he's a, a respected member of the council. And it says, Mark says, who was also looking for the kingdom of God. Now, do you know, this is a very interesting thing to say because here, here he is, a respected Jew. Um, believes in Jesus on the quiet for fear of, of, you know, of, of what the Jews might do to him. But he's also looking for the kingdom. Do you know, I think this is a nice expression because I think there are so many people, so many people who are secretly looking for the kingdom. Every one of us has within us eternity. It's in each of our souls. And we're looking for the kingdom. And do you know, really, everybody that have found themselves into false religions and all kinds of different strange things that we're so quick to chide people for. The truth is there are only people that are looking for salvation. That's all they're doing. In the book of Acts, in the, is it the 17th or the 18th chapter, 17th, I think, where Paul comes to, comes to Athens uh, and Paul is walking among the, the Athenian people and he says, you know, I see you are a very religious people. He said, I see you even have a temple, he says. You even got a temple to an unknown God. And Paul says, this, this unknown God, this one that you worship is unknown. This is the one I worship. Let me tell you all about him. And, and, and he says something very interesting, Paul. I must try and find it for you. Paul says, you know what? In this whole piece, you must understand that God has set this in the heart of men. Let me read it to you what Paul says um, in Acts 17 verse 22. It says, Paul, in the midst of the Aragopas, said, Men of Athens, I perceive you are a very religious people. For, for as I passed along and observed these objects of your worship, I also found an inscription to the unknown God. What they, therefore you worship as unknown, Paul says. This I proclaim to you, the God that made the world and everything in it, Paul says. Uh, Paul goes on to say, look, let me tell you about him. Uh, since he himself gives all mankind breath and life and everything, and he made everyone uh, from every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined and allotted the periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, Paul says, that they should seek God, watch this, in the hope that one day they might feel their way toward him and find him. So we have this picture of, of this a world of people that are kind of groping, 
the blindly, if you like, moving towards him to try and find him, feeling faces and shapes and, and experiencing spiritual things, if you like, moving their way. It, 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 it is really quite an extraordinary image. And he says, but yet this God that you're seeking, Paul says, he's not far from you. Indeed, in him we live and breathe and have our being, as you Greeks are fond of saying. It's an amazing mystery. And here we have this lovely description of Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. And he is, he, 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 he's, 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 he's been a secret lover. But now he's breaking forth. Now the fear that once bound him, now he sees his opportunity and he's got to go for it. Now remember, courage isn't the absence of fear. Not at all. Courage is the acknowledgement of fear. is the acceptance of it. And yet... Moving forward anyway, being, being prepared to go forward. Um, Luke says that he's a good and righteous man. Um, and he said that in Luke's case, he said he hadn't consented to the decision and their action because he was a man that was looking for the kingdom of God. So while there was all this furore going on around, while there was all this you know, screaming and shouting to get him, no, he wasn't part of that. He couldn't countenance that. And watch this. Let's go back to the text, because we, this surely ought to leap off the page to us by now. Who does he come with? He comes with none, none other than Nicodemus. Now that should speak volumes to us, because we have, first of all, it says, let's read it again. Um, he says, and he came with, and after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body away. Um, Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus by night. Now this is really nice. Because now we have this nice picture here of saying, what, what once Nicodemus was like Joseph of Arimathea, he kind of knew there was something and he snuck into Jesus' home. Do you remember in John chapter 3 and has this secret discussion with Jesus? But now Nicodemus, Nicodemus has seen it and Nicodemus is now a child of the light and Nicodemus comes boldly where he once came furtively and under the cover of darkness. Now he comes in broad daylight and not only does he come in broad daylight to speak to Jesus, remember he came at night to speak to a living Jesus. Now he comes in daylight to take away the dead body of Jesus. I mean, that's an incredible transformation. And he comes, I think, symbolically, I feel, he comes almost as if he's one of the wise men, because look what he comes, comes and brings with him. He comes to bring with him myrrh and aloes. And I think there's that lovely sense of, the, as the king, as the, as the wise men came to visit Jesus at his birth, so now the wise men come to deal with Jesus in his death. And I think that's really very, very lovely. Um, now, it's kind of interesting here because uh, the, the, the body is bound in linen, and linen is always the picture of humanity. Uh, in, 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 in when you look at the spiritual types, in the, in the realm of spiritual types, the significance of linen is that it is the picture of humanity. And so Jesus is now kind of uh, wrapped in humanity, if you like. And that's another, another nice picture. Because if you see Jesus in that way, what, what you're kind of essentially saying to yourself is that Jesus, Jesus now becomes the picture for us. Or the, the, all of humanity is kind of like, it is kind of bound around him. It's almost to say that uh, where he's going, his destiny is our destiny. And of course, Paul will say that if we were crucified with him, uh, and then he, having been crucified with Christ, we're buried with Christ, then we rise with Christ. But that, that binding of humanity around him feels to me like a quite an important thing to say. It's, an, it's, an, it's a nice, I think it's a nice idea. There's something that seems to me to kind of step across from this sort of, um, the, the terrestrial to the celestial, if you like. I think it's kind of quite a nice idea. Um, but he's bound in there. Now, uh, what happens next? Well, what happens next is, as we come to this, let's jump back in the story. Um, sorry, I, I did get carried away. These stories fascinate, fascinate me. Um, so he's taken away, and he's taken away to this new tomb, and I think that's quite important. Um, no one would have been laid there. Uh, and so he's laid in the garden tomb. I, I don't know, I just feel maybe this is another picture of Jesus' last Adam. Because, of course, where do we discover this whole of creation begins? It begins in the garden. So where's the new creation going to begin? In the garden. And so you've got this picture 
picture, haven't you? Of what, and I think this seems really nicely set for this, that you've got this picture set up of Jesus as last Adam laid in the garden of Eden. Uh, and, and he's wrapped in this linen. Now remember that Adam was hidden in the garden and he had wrapped around himself these coverings. And it just, it just feels to me like this story is getting bookended. It feels to me like the story is kind of really beginning to kind of make some, make some sense to me. Um, but it's a day of preparation. And because it's a day of preparation, uh, it, 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 it's almost like nothing can happen now. So we're just, we're just, the scene just kind of, kind of gets set. Um, and then you get left waiting for this, um, for what will happen after the Sabbath. Um, let's, let's take a look at how Matthew deals with it, just one second, let me think, I think there's something in Matthew for us to just kind of grab. In Matthew, what is it, 27, let's have a look, um, I think Matthew deals with this as well. Um, Matthew 27, where is it? Um, yeah, Matthew deals with this, Matthew 27, 57. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea. He says evening, which is interesting. Um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a man named Joseph, who was his disciple of Jesus. And he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in, clean, in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, he says, which he had cut into the rock. And he rolled a great stone of the, ent of the entrance of the tomb away. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Well now there's some new um, information been brought here and it's quite interesting isn't it? Because firstly Jesus is going to be laying, placed in a tomb that had been hewn from the rock. And again one senses Exodus 1 <clears throat> has the imagery of Christ as the rock and he's placed inside himself and the, 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 but this stone has to be rolled away and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, to that in a moment but the scene at the moment closes Jesus is placed into the rock, into himself the stone that was rolled away is covered over again and we're left with Mary, the two Marys, the Hail Marys I think sat waiting, watching, wondering opposite the two. Night falls and in the divine darkness the mystery of salvation is at work. But not that the naked eye can see it. But next time we'll pick up and see what happens. You know of course what's going to happen. But we'll see if we can find a new way and some twists and some new insights in looking at it. Alright, God bless and love you. Bye bye. Everybody I know who really gets this message at a gut level has been to hell and back. I don't know anybody that really gets this that's not been in the slough of despond in the depths of hell. And it's only when you're down in the depths of hell that you can come to that, mo that grace moment. You see, grace isn't just some cute little theology. That's not what it is. Grace isn't for the strong. Don't think grace is for the strong. It's not even for the weak, because if you say you're weak, you're saying you've got some strength. Grace is for dead people. Grace is for people that have got nothing and nowhere else to go, who are finished, who are down and out, who are over. It's finished. And it's for people who are in the wilderness. You find grace, Jeremiah said, in the wilderness. That's where you find grace. When you're in the wilderness, in the midst of despair, and there's nowhere for you to go, that's when you hear the voice of grace. And this young man is in the wilderness. He's in despair. And the Bible says, and the famine came on him.
attention and swing back up again. But you gotta hit the bottom. But the problem is you don't know how deep your self-reliance gets. 